Hey everyone, uh, I've got another podcast. It's actually on time for once. Uh, this time I'm joined by Chris. You will probably know who they are, uh, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Cool. Um, I'm Chris, as Holden said. Uh, I go by CC on our on our server where, where we met, which I think is kind of the the main place we're going to be talking about like, if we've if we've spoken about stuff like that. Yeah, I'm a musician. I've I've kind of made that my life's thing. I've gone to uni for four years to study music, made it a bit of more of a professional thing by becoming a music teacher, but had I think it's now coming up to like three years experience playing live, um helping people with songwriting, kind of I wouldn't call it consulting, but kind of just helping people along on their kind of songwriting little paths as well. So yeah, that's that's what I do. Okay. So we're going to be if you listen to the last episode of the podcast, this one's going to follow a pretty similar structure. Um first this time though, I actually have some news about the podcast. So I figure I'd start with that. Um so along with the YouTube, the podcast is actually now available on like a shit ton of different podcast platforms. Um I'm going to list them all off here and then later on I'm going to I'm going to have them linked in the description or whatever so it's now available on anchor apple podcasts breaker Castbox, google podcasts uh, overcast pocket casts radio public spotify and probably other places i don't know about because i found out about half of these just by chance i just googled my name and found them so there's probably more i don't know <laughs> um i've also set up an email address just for the podcast which is podcastb at gmail.com uh just in case anyone wants to send in questions or suggestions or anything also if you do listen to the podcast, if you want to email me and just tell me where you listen to it, just because I find that interesting, that would be great. Other than that, there's not really much else. So, what have you been up to recently? Oh, well, um, as I think, as everyone knows, we've, we've not really done anything kind of big. Like, the whole the whole global situation has kind of put a damper on stuff. Yeah, just a bit. But like as as kind of part of the teaching thing, I'm on I'm on holiday, which is lovely. It's it's I'm I'm in the fourth, maybe fifth. Oh no, I've just lost a week. I'm in the fifth week of the summer holidays, um, and I got a PC, which is it's the first gaming PC I've had uh, ever. Up until now, I've been struggling with a MacBook and and trying to make things work on that, which is an absolute shit show. So that just doesn't work. Um, but now, yeah. Got got the PC and and just been trawling through anything that I can get my hands on to just just see see what PC gaming is like essentially. Like today, been jumping into uh, Microsoft Flight Sim, and I've never played a flight sim game before, and it's an experience. It's it's pretty good. I'm kind of enjoying it. I was gonna say I think the last one I played might have been like nearly twenty years ago. But then I realized the last one came out nearly 20 years ago. Yeah, it's been ages. So it might have been that one that I last played. I think it was, it was, I think someone, I was watching someone earlier and someone said it was 2006. So the last one came out 14 years ago. God. Oh. <laughs> and you think it's like, it's like an institution. Mm-hmm. If you think of what people, well, or, or I think everybody has played a flight sim at some point. Yeah. And to think they came out 14 years ago, that, that is... And at least like mad, really, on Microsoft part. Like it's not a genre I particularly delve into, but at least to my knowledge, it's not like really got any competitors. So you've like kind of just gone like fifteen years without a flight sim at all. Because it's like more arcadey ones and shit, like Ace Combat and that. But yeah, I think like it, it it goes for that niche. It goes for that. Do you want to like today? Do you want to fly from Birmingham Airport <laughs> to Cork Airport? And I was like, I'll give that a go because that's I like two years ago I went to Ireland. That's the that's the literal plane trip that I took, and it was so uneventful. Yeah, but I enjoyed it the entire way. It was just like takeoff was a bit of an event, and then it was just steady cruising, and then landing was an event. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why I've enjoyed that so much. It's just it's a very weird niche kind of thing to enjoy I, I i do see why people get into it though I, I i think i think the first thing i said after finishing that flight i was like yeah yeah i really need, I, I want a flight stick I, w- I want this to feel good i want this to feel kind of natural um because yeah that's my only complaint with it the numpad controls 
are just a bit weird. Like if you tap, yeah. So like numpad two to pull up, it does it in increments, mm-hmm. and so it's not like a smooth pull up. It will like you'll see the the um. I think it's called a yoke, but I'll call it a joystick. You'll see the joystick in front of you yeah. move back in like a jerk, like dip, dip, and it will just do little motions. And yeah, that's that's thrown me off a couple of times. Hmm. It's it's a bit of an odd way to control it. I tried using a joystick once and then couldn't get it to work and gave up. Mm. That is that is my entire experience with yeah. using joysticks on computers. <laughs> yeah. I'd hope they're like a little bit more like plug and play. Like hopefully that you'd be able to just like I saw there's a Logitech like G yeah. Tech Hero or G Tech one, which you'd hope is just a bit like right USB in you go, and should just detect it all and work straight away without too much setup. But you never know. You'd hope. Yeah, I um I have a Mac as well because I used to do some um like uh Mac and iOS dev- uh, development. Yeah. Um. And I think, I think the only game I've actually played on it is FTL. Yeah, I, I, I well, having a look at Steam, I think I got it was something like fifty hours, <laughs> and it was like okay, that that's like that obviously ran really well. I've also somehow I did this because loading up everything onto the PC started having a bit of a look from my old Steam library. I think I had something like ten hours on Dead Island, and I was like, how did I manage to get? I don't think that runs on Mac. So I don't know when I got my hands on a PC to actually do that, but yeah, that's 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 happened at some point in my life, and I've forgotten that I did that. Yeah, I uh, I tried Dead Island once. I got about twenty minutes into it and just decided it wasn't for me. Yeah, just so jank, I couldn't deal with it. I think it was that it's if I remember right, it's got that weird head bob when you mm-hmm. move. And it's just, I think stuff like that throws me off sometimes. Like it, it's, it, if it doesn't feel natural to move, and probably that is that is probably more natural to move mm-hmm. like that. But if it doesn't feel like other FPS do, it's a bit, it's a bit odd. Yeah, no, it, like it's weird though because like stuff like that feels really weird in like, yeah. uh, like in like normal video games. But there's a lot of stuff with, uh, like when you're in VR stuff, adding little things like that ends up helping like helping with the immersion and stops you feeling like sick and stuff while you're playing yeah um it's just kind of weird how it like the stuff that like usually would really draw you out of the experience is exactly the stuff that pulls you into it in different formats yeah exactly i think it's like it's um maybe the next step is is the vr thing no weirdly that that's been brought up i had i had a chat with my with my dad because uh llama soft the old jeff minter um the proper Kind of legacy developers in the uk mm-hmm. they released moose life recently which is awesome again i've been playing that which is just insane in terms of like what it's doing on the screen it's it's that typical um what was the game they released it was polybius last year they did txk as well but the really old one was it's completely gone forgotten the name of that mm-hmm. but yeah these all these massive like these um flashy 80s kind of the 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 way that video games would have looked if they were on an episode of EastEnders back in the eighties, like yeah. this really weird. Oh, this is definitely what video games look like. Just just lines and colors and just everything all over the screen, and it's 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 pushing me towards this idea of going. This would look incredible in VR, and I know it would. And it's like, yeah, that that may be a little bit of a next step if if I ever get a little bit of extra money to look towards that. Well, I think the. Uh... The PC you got should like at least just run a VR headset, if not Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spectacularly, at least consistently. Yeah. Though did you um did you see that thing that's just come out with Oculus? Literally came out about an hour ago at the time of recording. The signing into Facebook thing. Yeah. Yeah. That I I I am being a bit more aware of all that stuff going on recently, of like how everything's linking up. Mm-hmm. And I had a I had a big push of just delinking a lot of stuff because it's like, yeah it is getting a little bit ridiculous in terms of how everything is lo- looped in through my Facebook. It was just that, like, early on after they got bought, they were talking about how they wouldn't integrate all this stuff, and now it's mm. been, what, like, six years or something, and now they're all integrating everything. It's just like, everyone knew it was coming eventually, but... Yeah, I suppose it's like, they knew they, they, knew they were going to do that. Uh, I, I suppose that's kind of like appeasing the audience for as much as you can, maybe, waiting out the tide to see if people stop mentioning it or forget it and just then 
oh yeah, it's happening now. And it's less of a less of an impact if it, if it's this far away, six years after they said they wouldn't do it. I don't know, because personally I would have... Personally it bothers me more. Because like, mm. when they first got bought out, they weren't even like... They weren't like public release kits or anything. They were still losing all the like dev kits that they had sent out. Yeah. Um, like you could buy a dev kit, but like you know, it weren't common or anything. So if at that time they'd done it, people would have been annoyed. But it would either have killed it that early on, or not affected it at all. Yeah. Whereas now doing it so late after it's already been adopted is just like annoying people more. Yeah, I I, I can see that as well. Yeah. Right. So do you want to get into the questions? Yeah, we can do. Okay, right. So, what's the first thing you remember making? Okay, um, I oh, I must have started playing guitar um, when I was about eleven or twelve, and at that time, I remember sitting in my friend's garage. Um, he had this old cassette. I, I models of all this music tech always fly past my head. I can I can never remember exact models of stuff. But he had this old cassette thing. Well, if it makes you feel better, and I wouldn't have any idea what a vinyl bar anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it just starts to get a bit ridiculous in in terms of what's been like what what it, what used to be around, and and even now what's around what's around now. <laughs> um, this old cassette thing, and we did a version of Ed Sheeran's "You Need Me, I Don't Need You," because mm-hmm. uh, it was a it was a looping cassette thing, so you could essentially just go right if you were if you were bang on in your timing, you could essentially just set a point where it would jump back. And it took us an entire afternoon. It was shocking because it just wasn't lined up well enough because obviously he's got all these bells and whistles in loop pedals and he's got everything to help him out in terms of... And it, he is just, as a musician, pretty fantastic. His internal timing clock is is just brilliant. And we obviously aren't Ed Sheeran. So it kind of came out to be that... Yeah, it was all right. It was, it was, it was all right for a couple of you know twelve year olds, a couple of teenagers in a garage, and then you listen back to it. I think he found it a couple of years later, and it was just not. It was not listenable at <laughs> all. So, like, is that when you like sort of got into making stuff at all, or have you like had like an urge to make stuff before that as well? Yeah, I think like um, before that, it was music's always been kind of interesting music's always been in the family is a weird thing um dad's an electronic musician makes makes bleepy music as i keep redu- reducing it to um mum sing used to sing in a band and they always raised us on music and it was like we always had piano in the house we always had guitars we were always encouraged to sing um but it was never really until like i hit that teenage stage of going playing guitar would be really cool singing would be really cool and so i want to take a look at making my own stuff and so yeah it it was always like it was always a creative environment I guess you can call it uh but I never took that first step and it was yeah only really when I got to being a teenager um which I suppose like that's that's the time most people get into it like I think with even people who like what you're doing for example the the playing games and having a bit of like a talk over them I'm sure that started in a weirdly way, similar way, maybe not the whole YouTube side of it, but as a teenager, kind of like talking about it with your mates like while, you, while you're playing it. Yeah, like I, I remember like as a child, like I suppose most people do though, you know, just like talking with your like friends on like the playground about what you're playing recently. Yeah, yeah. I remember one guy in particular, we talk and he just come up with like utter bullshit all the time. <laughs> um, like, I remember one story about... Um, it was Pokemon Snap. Mm-hmm. And I was like really into Pokemon Snap and I was playing it and I was talking to him about it. And he was all like, oh, yeah, if you if you do this thing, you can get like different colored gold bats. And <laughs> right. I was like, what? <laughs> and he's just he just come out with such shit. <laughs> they use strength on the truck and you'll get a Mew. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> I, I had a friend who convinced me that he had a Mew and he would never turn on his Game Boy around us uh, just because he knew he'd buried himself so deep in the lie that he was like yeah no oh, it, it's just not working to oh, i've run out of batteries i can't play with you guys today oh yeah 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 sure you don't have you don't have that mew and it's yeah i think that's what's led to a lot of this youtube talking over games thing is is that I, I love talking about games with people so it's let's just make this let's make this my thing to do let's make this my career and for a lot of people 
So are there any like particular avenues or like genres of music that you are like particularly drawn to or is it just anything really? I think it's like acoustic singer songwriter stuff was immediately really attractive to me because it was when I was working a very, very, um, I think it might have been illegal to have been working this young, but I was like 13 working in a chicken shed, like egg packing shed. Um, Okay, then. And we had the radio on and uh, Zane Lowe played Frank Turner. And it was like listening to that. I was like, oh, he is literally just playing guitar and he's singing, but he's got such emotion and he's telling such an incredible story. That like stood out to me as this fantastic genre to get into. Um, and so yeah, that that really stood out, and that was what I'd always do by myself. And then when I met up with other people, because they wouldn't be into that same kind of stuff, it was always Green Day and Fallout Boy and Blink One Eighty Two, and just trying to do the next pop punk thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that yeah, the genre that kind of always has been the passion is the singer songwriter stuff, the stuff which I can just sit and do now. I could, I could pick up a guitar and sing you know and do it in my, in my spare room without needing tons of stuff is it that you like particularly enjoy making the music that you like listening to it most or is it just that you uh, no I, I kind of i listen to anything and everything really i try to at least um so i can for the for the whole teaching side of it so i can have a really wide idea of music so like if let's say a kid comes in and he's gone oh i've been listening to I don't know, I've been listening to 80s like glam rock. I can go, oh yeah, here's some good artists who you might who I might be able to recommend. Um But what I play is like I don't really listen to as much of that stuff these days because I get the satisfaction of playing it instead of listening to it. Mm-hmm. Um which I think is a really if I think about how that goes with so like what you were talking to Gary about last week, where you play the games on your channel which you're going to record. Um, I kind of play the songs which I don't listen to, which I just want to play. And yeah. and that's the kind of stuff I, I just I just play those songs just by playing them and maybe chucking a video up, up of them every now and then. But then I don't go away and listen to that music. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. If everything sounds a bit weird, it's because my internet fucked up. And I've had to like restart everything. So we're gonna redo some bits we already did and then carry on with the rest of it. But it's just in case this bit sounds really weird compared to the last bit. Shouldn't, but just in case. So let's get into the actual questions for the second time. <laughs> so would you say that's the sort of music you're particularly drawn to making? I think like the acoustic stuff, yeah. Um I'm not like a mo- I'm not like modeling myself after Ed yeah. Sheeran um and trying to loop everything, but I think, yeah, that that acoustic style of being the person who provides the entertainment, not needing like a drummer and a bassist, but being a singer songwriter on stage, essentially by by yourself and, and managing to hold the crowd and entertain in that mm-hmm. way. Yeah. So one of the reasons in particular that I wanted to get you on is because like, I, I don't get music. Right. Like what I mean is, is that it's not the urge to do stuff because I like the idea of making music. Yeah. But what I don't get is I understand how you draw. I understand how you make games. I understand how you make films. I understand how you make like YouTube videos. I understand how mm. you do so many of these things, but I do not grasp how to make music. I find music is this uh, I find it very hard to look past the things I know with music. Okay. So that's one of the reasons like I say that I wanted to get you on is because like that sort of perspective of from someone who does get it is just intriguing to me yeah i mean i to kind of to that point i don't think i fully understand how to draw like i can doodle Mm -hmm. but i don't think i can in my head go i am going to draw like like say i'm going to draw a person like the steps to do that i'd just draw a few random shapes and it would look shocking yeah i think the same thing with like making a youtube video i i wouldn't really know where to start Mm -hmm. but it's just that with music you just have to it's the foot in the door that that old kind of proverb once you get that foot in the door you are there Mm -hmm. and i know that's kind of like a job thing but it works for hobbies it works for it works for this kind of thing as well because once you get that snowball rolling with like learning guitar or learning any instrument 
I just go for guitar because it's it's kind of like my that's where I started. But once you get that foot in the door with your hobby, it does start to snowball. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've 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 spoken to a lot of people who have a, a similar kind of view, but mainly because their music education was a bit shocking um because it was when we were growing up it was it was really bad yeah in the uk like i i learned a bit of like everyone does like keyboard shit mm. at school um i did some violin and nice. some clarinet uh i also like I, I was like lead singer in a few bands that my friends and i set up a few times yeah it was, it was basically just the same band over and over again under a slightly yeah. different name <laughs> no, I, I know exactly the type yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but like we only ever just did covers and stuff yeah and it's weird because like i actually actually like i have friends who went on to make a relatively successful band um and then i think they split up and he's gone off doing whatever he does now but y- you get my point like i've always been like around people who like music and around people who like could make music but and i liked the idea of it but mm. there was just something about it that i just could not get yeah i think like that is that is kind of to do with just the way people tick, the way people's brains work. In that, you can learn how to play an instrument yeah. as as good as as good as you can from a textbook, or as good as you can from a teacher. But then, if if in your head it's just not going right, this just isn't. I'm not able to just sit down and just do this, mm-hmm. or it's just not working. It's just not kind of the the pieces aren't fitting together. Yeah, that that is a hurdle to get over. And that's a that's a big hurdle to get over because that's mindset and that's that's always tricky. Well, it, like to a to a further extent, like even when I was singing, we would we were like we just did covers and stuff, right? Yeah. But even outside of that, I I I've, I've said this to people before. I don't know what I sound like when I sing, and what I don't mean is I, I don't mean like I don't know what my voice sounds like. What I mean is is that I have this like inherent obsession with mimicry okay yeah so i just mimic exactly what i hear yeah so i don't know what i sound like i just know what other people sound like when i sing them do you get what i mean yeah i do i think that's mm-hmm. that is like as a songwriter i think that's the first thing that you, the first hurdle you get over is not just going um i like this style of music so i'm going to play in this style of music and you end up getting a copy of something yeah. that you listen to um so i think like the example we gave in the last recording or I gave was I, I listened to Frank Turner a lot. I kind of got into him as a, as a young kid and he's, yeah. he's an acoustic singer songwriter does folky punk stuff. And a lot of the time I was trying to be like him and I don't have his voice and mm-hmm. it just came out bad. It came out like, cause he can, he can get gruff. He can, he can kind of verge onto like screaming and in his, yeah. in his tone. And I can't, I'm too much of a nice, pure voice, little, like you know, mid. Um, I was about to say Middle East. It's not Middle East. Midlands, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Midlands kind of kid, and I just couldn't do that. And it was it was coming to that understanding of going right. Stop trying to do that. Process it in a different way. Like mm-hmm. and and that is a big songwriting hurdle. And I think that is what puts a lot of people off when when they're like, yeah, I, I want to start music, but I've just been for lack of a better word, kind of regurgitating the same stuff that yeah. other people have done. Yeah. So you you mentioned Frank Turner remind me. Um, I once saw well, I, I've seen him a couple of times. Yeah, but one time I saw him supporting Green Day. Yes, yeah, and yeah. it was at uh, Brixton, mm. and uh, he played his set, and then I can't I, I can't remember if it was that he finished early or if they were running late. But either way, he ended up with a load of time left at the end. Right. Um, and for some reason every time i've seen him he's been supporting other people and every time i've seen him he's always finished with live and let die yeah i feel <laughs> right but yeah what happened was he, he started playing it and then midway through the song someone came out and told him that he was going to have to fill so they just played the middle of live and let die for about six minutes <laughs> okay they just kept playing it and it was fine it was weird but yeah. they just carried on <laughs> and then ended the song just as everyone else was finished, but it was really fucking weird. Brilliant. I, I, I don't know about things like that. I because I've had this argument so many times with Frank Turner, not with Frank Turner, but about <laughs> Frank Turner, that he is a showman and he knows how to put on a good show. When I hear <laughs> yeah. that, though, I'm like, 
that's not a good way to put on a show. You, you, well, you've got other songs you can play for six minutes. To be fair, everyone really enjoyed it. Yeah, I bet it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think, God. like, maybe you would have done something else if they hadn't, if you know, if they'd have told him before we started playing that or something. Yeah. But they literally came out in the middle of him playing the song. That is, that is impressive. On a stage mm. management kind of view as well, like, yeah. uh, he's, he's in the middle of something. Let's, let's, let's not interrupt him. No, no. Let's just go out there and let's mm. just let's tell him he's got a certain amount of time left. Yeah. Do you want to go into the next question or do you want to have a quick side conversation about concerts? We can have a chat about concerts. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Right. So uh, are there any particular concerts you've been to that like stand out for you? Um, as as kind of cliche it is, as it is, my first concert is burned into my memory. There's a few that had really stood out and like burnt into my memory. But my first one... Um, I, because I think in the UK, the law is you can't, you're legally, you're not allowed to go to a concert unless you're 14 and that's still with adult supervision. And so my dad waited until me and my mate were 14. I think it was because he was 14 before me. So we got to my birthday and he was like, right, I'm going to take you to a gig. I'm going to take you to Nottingham Rock City and you're going to see this band called Terrorvision. And neither of us had a clue who they were. And Spotify was, I think, at the time, very early on. And so we went and did a bit of kind of quick listening and we did some like television research. We were like, yeah, they're all right. Like, it's our first live gig, so we're not going to complain. We went and they destroyed it. It was absolutely yeah. incredible. Like, and it, it really stood out to me as that example of a band doesn't have to be an album band only. Like, they, they can be fantastic on their albums and then absolutely steal the show when they're live or they can be shocking on their albums and then like just have this incredible atmosphere and i think there's there's a lot of bands hate to always bring them up it's coldplay of yeah. they are typical pop schlock like they will just churn out what will get them plays i think they i don't know if they're even right i haven't seen any coldplay music or heard any coldplay music for ages but yeah i've not heard anything for a while it's a bit weird isn't it like certain bands seem to drop off and then they'll come back with a feature and and like the next number one single yeah i think the last album that i remember they did was one that i actually liked and it was um viva la vida and prospects march and that was a solid album yeah i yeah after that though i know they did more yeah but i couldn't tell you oh no 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 i can remember paradise yeah okay yeah that's that's yeah. ringing a bell yeah but like I, I can't fucking tell you anything other than paradise that they've done ever since then and viva la vida was what like 2012 that was it was quite, something like that it was yeah. a long time ago at this point yeah 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 so to your point just while i'm thinking about it like the number of bands i've seen that are the opposite of that though where they're really good on the album and just like shit like yeah it's like really depressing i think that's a shame as well because like to me, and I think this is the opinion of a lot of music or people in the music industry, your album is your like advertising. Yeah. Because you do an album, then you go on tour. Mm-hmm. And that album is essentially meant to sell you your tickets. And you're meant to go, right, we're going to play some new songs off this album. They better be good enough to get people in. We're obviously going to play yeah. some old ones, some bands. But if you're not able to deliver on that, that's a real shocking point to be at as like as a band, as a touring band. That's That's odd. What about you? What was what's like your most iconic gig? Uh, I have a couple. Yeah, I think first first I'll just want to go with um like my first concert. Yeah, yeah, I saw. Now, you might know these, you might not. Okay, because they were obscure. But basically, outside of this podcast, there is very little chance anyone will know who I'm talking about because <laughs> they were obscure British bands that split up like Brilliant. ten years ago. Um, it was two thousand and eight. I want to say. Right. Um, and my friend and I went to our first concert and I remember we had a massive argument just before we get there and I had to like fight him to get him back in the car so we could get there. <laughs> um, well, we got there and it was Attack, Attack and Tonight is Goodbye oh doing a co-headlining God. tour. Um, it was... You could just hear the typing straight away. Attack, Attack. I, I yeah. feel like I know that name. So... Right. This is the other thing. Do you know Attack Attack, the British band, or do you know Attack Attack, the American band? Because oh. the day, the way you know they're different 
is because attack attack the american bands are attack attack exclamation mark <laughs> and attack attack the english band are attack exclamation mark attack exclamation mark <laughs> of course they are uh, <laughs> uh let me just finish that off uh but i actually i ended up having um like I, uh, attack attack were all right yeah and but i actually ended up really liking tonight is goodbye um, I ended up playing one of their songs. At, well, was it their song, or was it the band? Because they were one of those bands as well, where they like split up and got back together multiple times under different names. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I ended up playing one of their songs at my wedding as well. Oh nice. Yeah, it was um the song my wife and I like danced, like I, our first dance to. I always, I kind of love that. Is when like you've got that legacy of the <laughs> bands that you've gone to see, and it all carries through. I think yeah. that's really nice. That's cool. Uh. That's my first concert, but as for concerts that really stand out, there's two. Yeah. One I'm actually going to save because I think you probably might want to talk about it anyway, just based on something we were talking about yesterday. Okay. The other one is I once saw, I saw Watsky. Oh, yeah. I saw him supported by Dumbfounded, which was the main reason I went, actually, because I just really like Dumbfounded. Yeah. Um, Dumbfounded left his laptop in his hotel room. Right. So he couldn't play any of his music. Oh my god. Okay. Right. So they got there and he was like, he came out on stage and he was like, I don't know what to do. Shall we go back to the hotel and get it? Or do you want me to just stay here and we'll just do it? And everyone's like, just do it. So we had this like acoustic set of Dumbfounded's music. Oh my uh, god. Dumbfounded's music. And it was like really cool. Yeah. <laughs> because it's just not something you like see all the time, is it? Yeah, I mean like, that's yeah. That's that's how some like iconic gigs get yeah made that's yeah just a mistake <laughs> yeah it, it was amazing like it was so good um but yeah so the other one is i saw pendulum just before they split up nice yeah what were they like uh, it was so good yeah it was really awkward because there were so many chefs <laughs> yeah and it was weird though because like it was awkward because there was me and my wife and like my wife is like She's not chappy, but she was, like, more normal than I was. Yep. But I was, like, not, like, super heavy emo, but pretty emo. So I, I like, stood out from everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, like, kind of awkward. But everyone was actually really nice. So I... we ended up just, like, all, like... I, I'm just awkward at concerts anyway, so I tried to stay on my own if I can. But there was just, like, 30 or 40 chavs, and they were just, like... But, right, so... You've been to Manchester, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I went to um, Albert Hall the old methodist church i think so it's near there so you might know do you know the gmex it's not called that anymore but... it rings a bell it does ring a bell it's called the manchester convention yeah, center yeah, now. Yeah. it used to be called the gmex it's just a better name but whatever so the point is it's a massive hall cool, yeah it's a convention hall it's not like a, it's, it's not for concerts it's a yeah, convention yeah. hall so it's huge but they rented the entire space out oh, that's cool. and they had like like food trucks in the back <laughs> And the front was this massive stage. Um, and it was like amazing. It was so good. And like, I'm not a big fan of the first album, but there's a song called Tarantula on the first album and it is so yeah. good live. I think that's that. That's how I know Pendulum. I think that, that song, because again, dad being an electronic kind of musician, <laughs> was him exploring all these different, when, it, when Pendulum was first like coming out, he was like, yeah. Like this is new electronic essentially, and and the end up playing Tarantula a few times. I was like, that's actually pretty good. Tarantula and Hold Your Color are like such yeah. good songs, but in general, I don't like drum and bass. Yeah, um, it it's so repetitive. <laughs> like, it, I I get that the people who like that like that, but I feel like half the songs should be like a quarter of the length as they actually are, because after a certain point, they don't explore anything new. It's just the same stuff over and over again. They really do milk them, and I think that yeah. it's it's milking them for the sake of, as you know, as stereotypical as it is, the people who are going to those gigs are hopped up on something, <laughs> and it's it's milking them so they can get their longest high <laughs> on this yeah. one song, and yeah. But so the reason I like Pendulum is what I was trying to get to is that um, the other two albums are like these weird like drum and bass rock fusions. Yeah. And that's what I ended up liking about it, is that there's like certain songs on the albums that I'm not big on because they go more heavy in the drum and bass direction. But mm. I liked the sort of like fusion with the music, but the sort of more lyrical aspects from like rock music. Yeah, like I, I, I think that stands out with Pendulum to me. It's, it's <laughs> not like it is electronica and it is like kind of drum and bass, but it's 
it is musical in its like lyrics in, in its lyrics yeah and, and yeah. him as a singer kind of yeah. delivers it in a really interesting way which you wouldn't expect from that kind of band like mm-hmm. yeah well to some extent as well is like i don't know a huge amount of australian bands yeah so like even that is just kind of different about them you know what i mean mm. so enough of me rambling about pendulum i suppose <laughs> <laughs> um well, do you want to go on to the next question yeah we can do okay so why do you make the things you do in particular? So, oh, I quite like that. Um, I've always thought, I think music has to be for you before anybody else. Mm. I think you have to kind of love what you are doing, yeah. especially with music, because it is you. You're putting yourself on show. I think, well, I say especially with music, you are putting yourself on show with every other form of art. Mm-hmm. Um, but in kind of like my line of music, I'm the face, I'm singing, I'm playing guitar also. And if I don't put the energy in that and, and show that I love what I'm doing, it just kind of gets lost. And I've done that in the past. I've tried to play songs, tried to appeal to people in kind of playing like a song that charted two weeks before. Yeah. And you can tell in the way I approach it and the way I do it, I just wasn't enjoying it. And I kind of hit this point in let's call it my musical journey um I hit this point in in that about three or four years ago and I just went I'm just gonna play what I enjoy yeah and that's kind of why I do it is because there may be people I've got I've got a story which I'll come back around to but um there may be people who really dislike what I do and that's entirely fine like that is down to them that they can do that, but if I like it, I know I'm happy in what I'm I'm doing, and and kind of my creative output is quite happy. Yeah, like that's that's like arguably the most important part of any of this. Really, is like like there's times like just two weeks ago, like when Fall Guys came out. Yeah, I don't really care. Yeah, like I was like, yeah, it looks alright. I'll try it, and then I think that week I played fall guys i so i actually rearranged my schedule that week so mm. that i could play fall guys as soon as possible because i thought it might do well and it did yeah like no one fucking cared whatsoever and the only thing that ended up happening was i waited longer to play the games i actually wanted to play yeah and you, you miss something in that it's it's because mm. i think like when we are creating videos it is i think like as we said or as you were talking with gary with like, about last week you do play games to make the videos but you're not playing games which are the current zeitgeist. You're not playing games which are the current hot thing. Yeah. It's like you're just choosing the game, you're playing it. And yeah, you're doing it for the video, you're doing it for the channel most of the time, but you're still choosing that based on what you want to do. Yeah. And yeah, and not just what's what's good at the minute. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's I quite like how it works across both art forms or most art forms of that is the way to approach it and I think people do forget that in a weird way. Yeah, so you had a story you wanted to tell. Oh, yeah. Um, So I dabbled in um, advertising my covers on Facebook every now and then um, because Facebook did this whole thing of, I think they still do because it's it's, it's how they make a bit of money is they'll say, your your post is doing all right right now. Your post is doing like 95% better than your other posts. Do you want to boost it to get even more views and they offered at the time like a free five pound boost yeah or something like that and you'd, yeah, you'd pay a few of those yeah yeah you'd, you'd pay like one pound over based on something something or other i never really understood it fully but i was like yeah i'll just do that and the first one i did which was the kind of sign to me that i was like i am not going to be able to please any everybody with what i do i will please myself and i'll like please like my family who kind of like my music and and my friends was I got a guy commenting on my cover of This Is The Day by The The. And he just went, it's not for me. I was like, oh, okay. okay. Was, yeah. And that was this guy. He was, it's not for me, mate. I was like, right. I replied, it's like, well, thanks for commenting. <laughs> it's like, and I just, I just had that moment of kind of, well, yeah, it's not going to be for you. Why did I boost it? Like, this is just being thrown into people's news feeds and just going the Facebook algorithm is going, oh, you like the, the, you might like this random British kid covering it in his bedroom. Yeah. It's, 
it's a bit of an odd thing. And so, yeah, that was like that. I, I one of those moments where I was like, yeah, I just need to do this for myself, not for the random guy on Facebook who it's not for him. Like, yeah. Yeah. I had a, I had a similar comment on something I made once. I, I, I did a review of Assassin's Creed Syndicate when that came out. Yeah. And like, I didn't do that. I did that just because I really like Assassin's Creed. So I seem to bring up how much I like Assassin's Creed pretty often. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I just really like Assassin's Creed, so I wanted to do it anyway. So I did a review for that, and then I got a comment on the video that just said, this is fake, you're reading from a script. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, oh, what do you God. expect? Like, where do you expect me to get all these words from? <laughs> like, of course I'm reading from a script. I wrote the script. I, I really, I think, I wish people knew more about production in just just those basic levels of every single like review you will watch is words written down and like they are just reading that off to the point where I can't I, and this is going to be so vague but I remember watching a video review and it was quite a short video review and I was like oh that doesn't quite explain what I need about this game and I remember clicking through to the kind of website it I'm going to hedge a bet and say it might have been Polygon. Mm -hmm. And I clicked through to the Polygon review and it was just the first paragraph of that review <laughs> just being read out and put into a video form. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll read the rest of this now. But I could have literally just read this instead of yeah. watching that 30 second video. But it's quite naive for people to think that you don't write something down. You don't make any notes in any form. Even for this, like I've got a page of notes up right now to make sure I yeah. don't miss anything and stuff that I remember. I have also like... There was a video I tried to make a few years ago at this point where I didn't do that. Mm. I just made like, I made like super basic notes. And when I'm talking like basic, I'm talking like it was the name of her game and like <laughs> maybe a single sentence after that. Because I went to Gamescom and I just wanted to give my general opinions on the stuff I played at Gamescom. Yeah. Right? And I didn't, like I said, didn't script anything out, just wrote like really basic notes. And I sat in my room and I got my camera set up and I had my mic set up so that I could like, like, get better audio and everything mm -hmm. and then i just sat there and went yeah it was all right yeah <laughs> yeah it was all right and that was it i i had 60 <laughs> games on my list and i couldn't say anything but yeah it was all right every time and i just got i got so disheartened by that yeah. that i just didn't make another video like that for like months and then started writing stuff again and that's actually it's the entire reason why I do the sentence videos is mm. because at least then I can consistently write something because I actually find writing really hard. I talk about this a lot, but I, I just find writing really hard. So writing the sentence videos is short and quick, but it at least keeps me writing something. So I'm getting at least used to it, if not better at it. Yeah, it's the approach you should take. It's like short bursts. I, I, I say this having like approached this from the teacher aspect. When people talk in the server of going, I'm going to become an amazing guitarist. I'm going to spend two hours a day on this. I'm like, that's dumb. Don't do that. You'll put yourself off. I, I actually, I remember that conversation actually. <laughs> yeah, I got a bit, <laughs> I got yeah. very teachery with that. Of just, yeah, but that's just not the way to approach it. You are going to burn yourself out. And especially doing stuff in short bursts, you find success. If you find a mistake in short burst, you can fix it within that very short amount of time. Yeah. Ideally. If you make a mistake for an entire two hour stretch, that is ingrained because you've just been playing that same mistake for two hours. Yeah, it, the, I had that with, um, I have like a disorder with my joints. So they're right. all really loose uh, and it ends up causing like a lot of pain. Yeah. Um. So I have to get physio for that. Right, yeah. And one of the things with my physio was that there is no point doing the physio to the end if you're doing it badly. Yeah. So they would rather me do like, two of the exercises or sorry not two of the exercises they want me to do all of the exercises but instead of doing like a full set of each they want you to just do like three good ones yeah and then if you start doing your form poorly just stop and then do them better when you're feeling better and that because yeah it, otherwise you just end up doing more harm well I, I've, I think i've approached this with like the students of going here's like here's a set of scales here's roughly what you're going to be improvising to do it three times and then come back and talk to me about it and don't because i know i've 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 seen it happen we we had to go observe other teachers at schools which is always lovely to do because you just kind of go you get a little bit of oh i'm, I'm pretty good at this compared to this person <laughs> um and it's like you see those teachers who go right that's your stuff you're off for the whole hour and it's like 
the same thing again it can be applied to all this creativity stuff you need to approach it in such a i'm going to do this with a goal and if i achieve that goal in a short amount of time fantastic if i am working at this and stressing myself out for over an hour it maybe needs to be reevaluated so to that point but like slightly further yeah long term projects like how do you deal with those i'm i think admittedly i'm quite bad with long term projects yeah um, yeah same i i love doing short bursts of work of going like i i listen to like maybe i've got spotify on um and i've got like a typical spotify radio going and i hear like a um i hear a song which i want to do and so i go right i'm going to look at the chords for that i'm going to play that a couple of times i'll leave it and then i'll record it the next day that's yeah. really short term in terms of like how music should be done and how music should be recorded yeah um like i'm the same with the like i keep bringing elbow you like the sentence videos yeah i will finish a game and within two hours of finishing the game have it done yeah. like i'll have like written it recorded it edited it and uh depending on when it's supposed to go out uh rendered it out at the moment i'm not rendering anything out because i have all of my sentence videos written up till 2022 so Amazing. i've got a bit of time <laughs> um but yeah so i think like, yeah it's yeah, in, in more like that's that's how how i do short pro is short term long term my approach is really if i have to do a long term like like i said i do avoid them and i'd rather go towards short term if I have to do a long term, I am just over meticulous in my planning. So the thing that comes to mind for me is the most recent long term I've done is a, a full band recording of a Bob Dylan song. And we had we had drums, bass, guitar, someone playing harmonica, someone playing banjo and someone singing six instruments. But then in total track wise, you're probably looking at, I'd say about like a max 16 tracks. And my approach to that was we are not going to try blast this out in a short term session because that is how mistakes get made. That's how we yeah. stress ourselves out. So I ended up booking the recording studio for four weeks. I said, first session, we're going to do drums and bass. That's it. And even if we finish early, we're not doing anything extra. <laughs> and the other musicians kind of like, I remember chatting to them just going like, like this is how it's going to be and they were like right we've not done this in the past like usually we use all the recording time I was like yep I know I understand that but I want to see if this is the right way to approach a long-term project and yeah then the next few recording sessions we got people in to do we got the banjo done we got the guitar done we got the singing harmonica done and then the final session was like mixing and mastering mm -hmm. the finished product in my opinion it was for a uni project it was for somebody some, I think somebody's final recording and they just asked me to yeah. supervise it. It was like the final product was so much better than, in my opinion, the stuff that other people had tried to churn out in three days just because yeah. they wanted to get it done as quick as possible. Um, and so, yeah, that, that in my mind shed that light on like long-term projects. They do need meticulous planning yeah. and you just need to, you need to sit down and go, this is how it's going to be and stick to a schedule. If, if, if that's what, if that's all it takes, like stick into that, Session one, we do drums and bass. Session two, we do this, this, blah, blah, blah. That made me, and it made the other instrumentalists aware, they had to be ready for certain days. And it it just, it got everything planned down to like this this fine tooth comb going through everything. I talked about like sort of like the feel of making like shorter and longer ones and how it's easier to do one than the other or like rather that you've got to approach them both in different ways. Yeah. It kind of leads into the next question. Cool. Which was... What does the drive to create feel like to you? Okay, yeah. To extrapolate a little bit, you can also encompass within that, like, sort of, like, how to keep your motivation going. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, it's it comes down to I want to, I want to get better in a really weird way. And I know I've been, like, 26 now, so I've been playing guitar for 14 years, and I've been singing for nine so <laughs> at that stage a lot of people still go like why do why do you approach it in terms of getting better but i i don't think there is an end point i've, I've always said this with musicians there isn't an end point to how you're developing 
you may feel like you have mastered what you currently do, but you're not done learning, you're not done improving. And that's always been my drive is to go, I know I can be better than what I currently am. So I'll keep trying new songs. I'll keep recording stuff. And the whole process of recording it for me, my kind of in a separate, like related, but in a kind of separate strain, uh, strand is like, I record the stuff to kind of hold myself accountable. And my drive to record mm -hmm. is so I have all this if I ever want to look back on it. Um, because I've had plenty of conversations with again, like my dad and my mum, who were in the band together, but all the recordings of the stuff that they had back then are just gone. And I'm like with the, yeah. the countless conversations we've had of just going, I wish they they, they wish they wish they could listen back of, of all the stuff that they made. And they can't, and that's a shame. And so kind of my drive to kind of get myself categorizing it, categorizing it's not really the right word, but recording it is, is it. My drive to get it all recorded and on the internet is just that I want to be able to show people this. I want to be able to look back on this when I'm older, when maybe I'm not able to do this anymore because voices change and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I find drive quite an interesting thing to talk about. Do you sort of uh, see it entirely as an internal or does like external validation help? I think it always helps. Yeah. I think you can't can't like turn it down. Um like recently we've I've been doing a duo with one of my old mates from school and we kind of ummed and ahed of just of creating something like a Facebook page straight away and putting videos up of us practicing and rehearsing. Um and we both just kind of settled on just going, why don't just do it? Like this is it's a silly thing to fret about let's just do it and put it up mm -hmm. and the feeling we get is is great because it's especially for him who hasn't been a musician he's 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 been in maths he's a maths teacher so that has been his entire current life he gets to experience all this validation that as a musician i've been getting for the past nine years of, of going like people like listening to the stuff that i do and it's really nice to see that and so, yeah, I, f I think I think external va uh, like validation has its value. Um, I still I come I always come back to you should yeah. be pleasing yourself first. You should you should have the internal validation first before you seek it external. And I think that's like uh, to kind of spin it back onto you. It's like you can't really avoid external validation, surely in 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 your line. Well, I mean, I do. <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> I get like very little validation. Like average views on my channel is what, like maybe two. I think like yeah. So maybe your your validation is talking maybe on the server of like talking about what you've recorded and talking about like what you did on the stream in a way. It's not even that to be honest. I actually tend to avoid it. Like I don't. Um, I I care very little about the external validation. Okay. Um. Like, the reason I make videos and stuff was entirely just so I could get through my backlog. Nice. I just had a shit ton of games I wanted to play, and I had no particular reason to. Yeah. So I started making videos, and every video is me playing one of the games that I've bought at some point. Like, sometimes it's new, but more often than not, it's a game I've owned for years. I think that's really interesting. And it's literally, it's literally just so that I can get everything done. Um... I do it because I like doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, sure. I would like it if people liked them more. But with how my channel is, if I was that bothered about the external validation, I just wouldn't make anything at this point. Yeah. Because, like, I, um, I, I had a video go up an hour and 40 minutes ago at this point. Yeah. Right? That's got zero views. Uh, uh, yesterday, zero. Day before, zero. Day before, one. Day before that, zero, 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 one, zero. Like, you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I think of the last of the last like 30 videos I've released there is one with double digit views right. and everything else is below 4. And it's like I would sure like people to care, but I don't really care that people don't care. I'm just going to keep doing it. Yeah, I think that's like if you've started off with that mindset of I've I've done that. I didn't know you were doing this to clear your backlog. It, it's it's like <laughs> I think that's such an interesting reason to start something like this because you see so many YouTubers and so many streamers go into it going, yeah. I want people to see what I'm doing. And it's like, that's 
sure yeah. that's fine that that's an approach like if that's what you want to do and but that's a very that is a very external approach and that's that's not pleasing yourself as an internal person you're just going I want people to see me I want I want I want them to experience me experiencing yeah. something well it's like I I do the videos originally started as just I want to make sure I actually play something so here's I'll make a video each week of me doing stuff well actually yeah. no that's not even true the original video started because I was like I used to make videos and then I was like it'd be nice if I started making videos again. So I just decided I'm going to make a video a week. Uh, and that was 2018, nice, yeah. right? So at that point, I was like, I'll make a video a week. Uh, and that's when I, st- I first started with a load of like old footage of like bugs from different games. Mm-hmm. Just threw all that up. And then I did, after that was, I uh, started doing all the Monster Hunter stuff. Yeah. yeah. So like... That was probably the time when my channel was doing best was when I was just putting up Monster Hunter videos all the time. Um, yeah. And then I, I just like fell off Monster Hunter. I was going to ask about this because it was one of my little burning questions, yeah. which I've always, when we've, when you've been in the channel um, and when you, when, when Iceborne's been brought up, you're always, you stopped at Nagakuga. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I think Iceborne gets great after that. I've always just wanted to say, like, why did you stop there? Uh, I just wasn't particularly enjoying it. To be honest, yeah. that, that was like it. Like at the time, I got into Iceborne a bit late, mm. and I also never moved to PC. So I a lot of the enjoyment I had with like early Monster Hunter, early world is very easy. Yeah. Um. Basically, everything up to the Elder Dragons is easy. Um. And what I mean by easy is not like there's no challenge. It was all just what I mean is. I didn't have any reason to play with other people. Yeah, I could see that. So I could do all of that on my own. And I had like no issues with that and I was fine. And then you get to the Elder Dragons and it gets a bit more difficult, but I still managed to do all of those on my own. I did like the Sapphire Star, did that on my own. Like, you know, I I did all of the stuff basically up to Iceborne on my own. And then I got into Iceborne and I was like, I probably could do it on my own. But between those two times, I had played a shit ton with other people. Mm. And I enjoyed playing with other people so much more than I enjoy playing on my right. own. And it meant that when I was playing on my own trying to do stuff, I was just not really enjoying it. But also because it, like I wasn't really enjoying it, but also because, as I said, I didn't move over to PC and I got into it a bit late and I was on PS4, getting to play with other people was just harder. Yeah, I've, I've found that in terms of before they started rolling out these free updates and the title updates and all this stuff, PS4 mm-hmm. died a death. Like the the community on the PS4 was just it was a ghost town, yeah. And I remember going on of like this was before Iceborne dropped. I remember going on of wanting to gear up essentially, of wanting to like we just wanted to play more, just wanted to get back into it before the expansion dropped, yeah. And it was always me alone in the hunting hall, trying to just 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 having a couple of hunts. And I would always stop after two. <laughs> I I had this routine of like I'd, I'd log on, I'd do a couple of hunts, I would stop after two and get a little bit like just downhearted about it because we did have a really good community in in terms of how people approached it and and like making the videos like the wiggler squad stuff yeah like that was a really interesting way of doing stuff and i i think like it it made me want to play the game more because we could see interesting stuff we could do funny little little things like that um it kind of came back with iceborne but then again it's it goes through these big peaks of of people playing right down to there's nobody on and the split in the player base between pc and ps4 uh, ps4 just absolutely ruined that yeah and we still have to acknowledge that the xbox version exists i sure yeah (laughs) yes we i know do (laughs) i know literally one person who has it i don't i can't remember anybody who does Uh, stray's got it does he right okay (laughs) no um but yeah, like that's really what threw me off. Like I was doing, I was trying to, I tried to get back into Iceborne. Yeah. And I was doing one hunt a day and I did that. And then I got up to Nagakuga and I gave it a try. And I think I died my first time. Mm. And I was like, okay, I'll try again tomorrow. And then I just didn't. Just never picked it up. Yeah. And I just, just never did after that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I was such a weird tangent, but it was just like. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, What were we talking about? I've forgotten. Oh yeah, no, I was giving a quick breakdown on what, like, how my videos yeah. went. 
after I got burned out on Monster Hunter, I just had, I had no ideas. Right. And I'd always had this like idea in the back of my mind about just making a video on games that I hadn't played yet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just do that then. So the first one technically wasn't a game I hadn't played yet, but it was a game that I was already interested in that hadn't come out yet. Yeah. So I thought it might do all right. So I did a video on the Monster Hunter. No, Uh, on the Magic the Gathering uh, arena. Arena, it's called. Oh, yeah. The beta for that. I did a video on that. And that was pretty good. Yeah. But I, I like magic anyway. So, and then after that, I started doing videos on games that at first I did games I was like familiar with. So I did FTL. Mm-hmm. And then I started going into games that I had like never played before. So the idea is with the series is that it was all games I had never played before. And it was literally just the first half hour of touching them. The only thing I will do before I record and record the game is I'll like go in and just make sure that the settings are right. So like it's the right resolution and everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but other than that, it is the first time I've played a game. And then it got to the point where I was like, well, I could do, they don't take a huge amount of work. These, so I'll just do a couple more. So I started doing two of those a week. And then I was like, well, I could stream as well. Cause half an hour isn't a very long time to try out a game for. So an hour and a half is better than that. Yeah. So I started streaming as well. And then I did like, full LPs of stuff, and then I stopped doing those because I wanted a break. But, like, the entire point is just, this is what this game is like for an hour and a half. Yeah. And that's it. And it's like, I would like it... I would like it if people watched the videos if they were like, I want this game, but I don't know what it's like. Yeah, so I, I've... um Well, I remember watching your Terraria one, which is, again, <laughs> is brought up a second time <laughs> in two episodes. Yeah. But I remember watching your Terraria one before I jumped into that final update. Or I think it was around the time where I was considering jumping back into that final update. Yeah. Because I played a lot of Terraria on PlayStation 3 and (laughs) was content with what I'd done with Terraria. Yeah. And then I was like, well, I'll give it, I'll give, yeah, I'll give your video a watch to see the opinion. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's actually, I feel a similar way of played a ton of it before. I went in to play the final update and it just hasn't grabbed me. Yeah. We tried to make a server thing happen. Yeah, I and remember. It just crashed and burned. Mm. But I then went back to play it solo and just didn't. I just didn't enjoy it in any way. And no. I've not right. I've not loaded it up back since. I I ended up I wanted to do it for that video anyway, so I did. So yeah. I went through as far as killing the wall of flesh. Right, yeah. So I killed every uh I can't remember what it's called. Softcore. Yeah. I know they changed the name, but it was called Softcore. I killed every Softcore boss. I, I never particularly liked hard mode anyway. I think it just ramps up too much too quick. Yeah. You are you are playing a losing game until you suddenly destroy a few demon altars and, and go mining, but you're being yeah. killed by things that float through walls. Yeah. Like, I, I've i never particularly liked it, so like... And this did nothing to change that. And it's just yeah. a real shame. To what I was saying earlier about not caring about people watching my stuff, though, Mm. that sort of stuff actually I'm the opposite about. So yeah. the half hours and the streams, the half hours I think could have value as like someone's just what a game is like, just in case you've never seen it before. Yeah. Um, the streams, I would like it if people came to my streams because I do like talking to people while I stream. It's just fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, I like doing that. Like very few people do, but it's, it's a good time when they do. Uh, Wasser turns up a lot, but he's not turned up in a while. And he's going to hear me tell him this while i'm talking right now so <laughs> turn up to my fucking streams <laughs> but the scripted stuff that i care about a lot more because that i put a lot more work into see i'm i i've just done this where i think this is a genuine issue with just how youtube interacts and how youtube kind of works your scripted ones mm-hmm. i try and watch every time they come up yeah. I've just looked now. The most recent scripted one was the game of the year 2010. Yep. Didn't see that. Just didn't no. appear. Well, and it's, it's the, it's the bane of YouTube of, I would love to see more stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't actually feel like it. I don't feel like I see it. So to some extent, I spoke about this in my video with, in my uh, podcast with Gary, but yeah. to some extent that is my fault. I am aware that this is my fault. One of the ways YouTube works is that it will, if you're not, constantly looking at your subscriptions page Mm. it's harder to find stuff because it tends to only show you things you already care about 
Yeah. And it has it learns what you care about by like what you watch a lot of. So like yeah. for me, it shows me a lot of Linus Tech Tips because I just like Linus Tech Tips. Yeah. <laughs> but it means that like all of my half hour stuff, if you don't click those, it thinks you don't care about my channel. Right. So me uploading the half hours, the streams and stuff that I know won't do as well actively harms all the other content I make. Yeah. And that sucks. Like, part of me is like, I don't care. And part of me is like, I wish everything else would do better. Yeah. Um. So I'm actually going to talk about this in my outro anyway. But I have a Patreon that I use. Nice. Okay. You can also just follow me on there without spending any money. Mm. All of my posts besides like currently one are free. The only thing I post that you have to pay to see is I post up a weekly schedule of everything that's coming out that week. And I put that up. That's only for paid patrons, just so they see what I'm working on early, because I actually am really uncomfortable talking about what I work on. Yeah. Yeah, so you can go there and everything's free. And the point is, is that if you're following me, it I think it sends you emails or something. You could probably turn that off. But the point is, everything goes up there at the same time every day. As soon as it comes out, it comes up there as well. Nice. Because I know I've, I've tried to follow the Discord bot whenever that happens. It's so it's so slow or it's just it just lags it. And it's like, right, that was two hours after this, like the stream one. Yeah, like the stream one's a nightmare. Yeah, like the the video bot doesn't bother me all my, all that much because like it's a bit late, but whatever, just watch the video. It's it's going up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But the stream, it's like I only stream for like usually about an hour as it is. Yeah. So it comes up like fucking ten minutes before my stream ends. It's just yeah. a waste of time. But there's nothing I can do to change that. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's. I've really because, like I said at the start, got a PC, mm -hmm. the Mac. I don't know why, I don't know what went on with it, but when I used to watch Twitch and try to watch Twitch on the Mac, it would, like, rock it. It was, it was oh, yeah. going nuclear, mm -hmm. and it just, it was, it was impossible to watch streams. And so something I've tried to start getting into doing now with, with like, the PC, which isn't going to explode when I watch Twitch <laughs> streams, um, is, is watch a few more streams. And mm -hmm. so, it, yeah, it's, yeah, you know, we're getting into the whole annoyance of, scheduling stuff essentially yeah. well so i'll i'll wrap this up quickly because we are mostly just talking about me making stuff at the moment. <laughs> got you on to talk about you no but, um we're good this is also all of the reason why everything i do is at the same time yeah the idea is is that even if you're not subscribed if you check back at my channel at eight o'clock at night every day it is there yeah there is something new at eight o'clock at night now granted some days that's a stream so it's not actually on the channel Mm -hmm. But it does go up on the channel like an hour after my stream's finished. Yeah. Because apparently once you start getting paid by Twitch to do stuff, you have to wait a day. But I'm not paid by Twitch. So <laughs> I can put up as soon as I'm done. Yeah. All of my stuff goes up on my channel at the latest an hour after I'm finished with it. Mm. So. But yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, to go back to your point about Max, I, I've got a new setup recently i posted pictures in the discord which you'll have seen for a while but this is an audio format so um <laughs> i've now got four screens around my desk oh yeah yeah so my fourth screen i actually use with my mac nice okay and as soon as i plug my mac into it the mac ramps up the fans as loud as they yep. go <laughs> and it's just like it is an absolute nightmare like i understand no that's a lie i don't understand <laughs> why they do it i know why they do it it's fucking stupid but like like it's to do with the way that the mac cooling system works they, they ramp up the fans as loud like as high as possible as soon as there's a load because it hits the thermal limit like really quickly it's just it's yeah. fucking stupid but whatever but yeah like max are just a nightmare whenever you're doing any work on them to be honest i had this up well i this is the whole reason why the pc thing happened it's just because mm -hmm. i i've realized the only realistic thing that i need a mac for is music production and mm -hmm. actually, at the end of the day, I don't need a Mac for that. I could yeah. relearn how to do all the music production on Windows stuff. Yeah, so I actually, like, you talked about that, uh, reminded me, I was going to ask anyway, like, how has your, like, music production sort of flow changed at all? Um, it's it's slowed down a bit, because mm -hmm. I used to just have these, I used, I've got these, like, two tables sat next to each other, mm -hmm. and it used to be that I had the Mac on the furthest left side with, like, a USB hub with every instrument that I needed plugged in and like my recording inter interface always, everything was always plugged in. So I could essentially fire up Logic if I had an idea 
I could just reach over to like my MIDI keyboard and and quickly work it out, or I could quickly grab a jack lead and plug in the guitar, and I would have that idea recorded within seconds. It's much harder now because the PC does take up a, up a lot of space. Um, so I found myself I've used my phone a lot more to record like voice notes, and so if I'm noodling about on the guitar and I, or I'm singing something or I'm trying to play something, I'll just have my phone recording at all times it kind of comes back to that creative process thing which we were talking about before of like my creative process i realized a long time ago that i improvise a lot of stuff like i'll just play around some chords think of some lyrics off the top of my head and i'll sing some melodies to them and i lost so many good songs because i would just sit and i'd do that for half an hour and then i put the guitar down and go that was a nice little play and I'd never, I'd never have a record of it and I'd never be able to sit down again and get that sounding exactly as it did at that time. Yeah. So I've now built that habit to just go put the phone on record whenever I'm sitting down and playing guitar, I have to sift through a lot of crap and I have yeah. to like, I have to constantly be moving them over and, and uploading them. Um, so they're off of my phone and so it's not eating up my phone storage, but it's an interesting workflow. It kind of, it, it suits the way I work. And I think it suits the kind of musician I am as well of like, try this interesting thing and try this thing as a solo musician and not fuss about it. And that's mm-hmm. kind of like the ethos it always comes back to is just don't fuss about it. Just do it. And, and it, it might turn out great. It might turn out to be absolute trash, but you'll have done it. And that's, that's kind of the key point. Is there any like, you know, like gear, yeah that you yeah, would yeah. like that would help with your workflow like what sort of stuff would you like that you don't currently have i think i've kind of got an all right setup in that i've got a recording input for, for what i do like my singer songwriter stuff mm-hmm. i'm decked out because i've got a i've got a microphone i've got an input what makes it difficult is trying out other styles because it starts to get into the reign of let's say i wanted to try out you know royal blood uh can't say i do so like they're a duo of just a bassist and a drummer okay. But he uses guitar pedals, he uses octave guitar pedals, he uses, I think, like, even two or three layered on top of each other, and, like, big heavy distortion to essentially get a guitar sound out of his bass. Okay. And it makes that two-piece sound like a Mm three-piece, and then he starts singing as well, or they both sing, so it's like, it eventually adds up to become, like, a four-piece, five-piece from two people. It's insane tech, and it's awesome, but that's the kind of thing that really starts to affect musicians in trying new styles it's like they've done this really awesome thing that i want to try oh the price point to get into that is a thousand pounds yeah yeah and it's it's really tricky in in terms of trying new styles is often limited by price point yeah like that's so i was going to ask about actually is um like when you say you've got like a mic and a setup and everything like what sort of mic is it it's a rode nt usb so it's like it works for usb that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if it was like USB or yeah. XLR or anything. Um, it's a decent USB mic. It's got its own little issues, but it does the job for what I need to do. Like I can, even if I don't want to plug in my guitar to like the Mac and do a full two track, like guitar and vocals recording, I can just shove the mic a little bit further back and capture it as just one track. It, it's yeah. a really kind of easy setup for me. Um, yeah, the, there's always, I think this is the, the curse of musicians is, there is always something else to buy. There's always something else that you want. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities in that with the sort of like audio recording for stuff that I yeah. do like this. It just an XLR mic is generally better. Yeah. But like you can get cheap ones, but even the cheap ones are like multiple hundreds. Yeah. Because you've got to get the mic, which tends to be a little bit cheaper, but then you've got to get the uh you've got to get like a mixer and everything, and like that's where like a load of the cost comes in. It's just there's a lot of avenues where it's like prohibitively expensive to just get slight upgrades. Yeah. So it's either you do the best you can with what you've got or you spend a shit ton of money. Yeah. And I think that's like, again, to, to kind of look at the comparisons between the two um, formats we work from, it's such a high price point to buy in to not know whether you're going to, one, enjoy it, or two, if you are trying to make a career of it, even be successful. And you end up spending... Yeah hundreds of pounds on something that might not even you might not even end up using because you you've kind of overestimated what you do or you don't enjoy or that kind of thing like even even now i could look at my amazon on 
just the most basic Rode microphone is £155. Yeah. That, as for somebody who just wants to get started making music, is, for me, that would have been, um, back when I didn't have all this equipment, that would have been a week's paycheck, or a two weeks' yeah. paycheck even, like when I was when I was first starting off. And you just can't afford that. That's 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 food. <laughs> that's it starts to get into that. In terms of my stuff, some of it I did purely get with the intention of making videos and stuff. A lot of it I didn't. A lot of it I wanted anyway, and a lot of it I got for like um yeah like the games that I make as well. But if you were to go off like this, I'll cost a certain amount, and like at my current rate, when is we're going to pay it off? I have spent like yeah. six grand on my setup, and currently I have earned about. Ten pound from like humble bundle partner yeah, yeah. money, like I if you use my link, I get money back from you buying stuff on yeah. the humble bundle. I've earned like a dollar on one of the video games I made, and I currently get two dollars a month on Patreon. Except it's not actually two dollars because after taxes it's one dollar fifty eight, and then after that it's actually more like one thirty five, and then after that you've got to convert it back into English, so it's about yeah. a pound. So in total, there's the sort of eleven pounds that I earned and the two, the one pound a month that I get, which means that it'll take me what, like 800 yeah. years to pay all this off. Like that is a guess. I didn't actually yeah, yeah. do the maths for anyone who cares, but <laughs> like, I'm never going to pay this off at my current rate. Like it is prohibitively expensive to get to just the ability to make stuff. Yeah. And I, I really weirdly to go back to our conversation ages back, back at this is mm-hmm. I wanted to get into drawing. And I wanted to actually look into how to do digital art as just a thing to just try, or just a pastime of just maybe I might enjoy this. Is just sitting and doodling for a bit, and because I have I've got book uh, booklets, notepads of just like school old school notepads, which I ended up looking through before I threw away. Mm-hmm. Like half of it's filled with doodles, yeah. And it's like I actually clearly enjoy doing this, so why don't I look into it? Looks at like getting a decent like digital like, drawing pad. Yeah, like a whack up or something. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> As an entry point to just do some digital kind of art. And then you're not even in, like you're not even considering software. Yeah. Because so then like, you've got to pay your license fees and all that. It it is for these like arts kind of hobbies, if we even starting them off as hobbies without even thinking of them becoming careers, the most expensive price points to get into them. I did actually buy myself a cheap drawing pad a few years ago. Yeah. Before I started making videos like properly again, uh, the year before that, I did a thing where I streamed every day for a month, and what I streamed was me drawing. Oh, nice! They're all still up on the channel. It was mostly just like random Nintendo characters. Yeah. To be completely clear, because if anyone listens this far and cares, it might bother them. I didn't draw anything new. I was literally just like, what's the term? Not like tracing, but like. No, but yeah, there's yeah. like a term for it. Yeah. But I was using, I was basically just redrawing the reference images exactly the same. Yeah. There were a couple of things where I did like make slight changes just because it's like it was what I wanted better. But generally, I was just like copying exact images. I spent like 50 quid on this tablet and it works fine, mm. but it's like not great. But like some of the buttons like stick to each other and stuff. It's weird. Yeah. But like even that, like 50 quid for some of the, like at the time, like granted, yeah, I could afford that, but 50 quid to drop just to, use it for a month and then throw it in a drawer and not touch it for three years after that. Like the only reason I could do that anyway is because I was lucky to get uh, Adobe CS6 before they moved to Creative Cloud. And that meant that I didn't have to pay for Creative Cloud and I've just had CS6 and I'm now still on CS6. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just never going to move from CS6. But like right now it's actually even harder because then you've also got the stuff where it's like, you could start using GIMP, but Mm. GIMP is terrible. I fucking hate GIMP. Yeah. I, I, I've tried using GIMP a lot and I just can't stand it. Well, I tried to do those, like, I'm sure you, yeah, you might might have seen it posted on the server a few times, is that fan Pokemon game, Infinite Fusion. And mm-hmm. the whole thing is, like, the fans have to make the sprites, which aren't just being generated by, like, the really yeah. rubbish kind of uh, program, which makes them look like monsters. Like, that whole thing is I tried to get used to doing that using GIMP. And it was so... It's just not user-friendly at all. Yeah, no, GIMP is so awkward. Yeah. And like, everyone else is saying, well, the people who were doing it properly, like there's a guy on the, uh, there's a guy on the um, Infinite Fusion stuff called Mammoth. He mm. does awesome, awesome work. And you kind of ask around what people are using. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm just using paint. And there's some people who are like, no, I use Photoshop. 
And it's like that is such a ridiculous gap in the software that people use to just mm-hmm. create these little sprites for a fan game. I think there's there's times with that sort of thing where y- it's quite easy to make up for lacking software if you're like incredibly talented or skilled. Yeah. But then when you don't have any of those things, it's kind of weird because like if you don't have the talent or skill already, it's harder to make do with the bad stuff. Yeah, I can see that. But when you're presented with the good stuff, sometimes it's too much. Yeah. So like it's it's like a hard balance for achieving that sort of terms, but it, I think at least it is a lot easier to learn how to make stuff when you have all the possible tools available to you. Because then you can always try and work out ways of doing stuff with shit later on. Yeah, I can see that. Like in the in the music side of things, if you got the f- if you got Logic and mm-hmm. you had the full suite of everything that Logic has to offer, you can teach yourself Logic and you can teach yourself how to record, mix, master, add effects because it has even it's very basic and it is nowhere near industry standard, but it has everything you might need to be able yeah. to teach yourself how to do it. And and then yeah, once you've done that, you can go on to other stuff. But like if I wanted to teach a kid recording, I wouldn't just set them up with these are just the things you need to record. I'd show them as much as I possibly could. Because yeah. you might trigger another int- interest of going like, actually I'm not much of a fan of recording. I am a fan of chucking on random effects and making this sound like it's from like space. It's like, yeah, yeah that's awesome. Let's delve into that a bit more. So have you looked at any of the non because I know Logic is Mac specific. Yeah. Have you looked at any of the sort of other stuff? Like I've got, it's called LMMS because um, Mars suggested it a mm. while ago when I was talking to him about it. I need to have a look. I, I know Cubase exists and yeah. Cubase is essentially, if I was going to just move from Mac to Windows, Cubase is the most like transferable skills kind of software to use. A lot of the stuff that I would do on Logic would just similarly work in a, in a similar kind of way on yeah. cubase there's 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 tons of stuff i just i know for a fact as well this pc will be able to handle much more audio processing and effects processing than my mac would and i even yeah. i upgraded the ram in my mac uh back when i was at uni um wow that must be an old mac it's it's a 2012 model yeah that's because that's not a thing you can do anymore. Yeah, in Mac years, that's <laughs> that's, yeah. that's an old old one. Yeah, mine. I've got one, and I think it's the late 2013. Yeah. The battery is technically dead on it now, so I have to leave it plugged in at all times. Because if I that's exactly the same with mine. Yeah. I took it to them, and I was like, "Can I get it fixed?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's 200 quid." And I was like, "I'm not giving you 200 quid to fix this." <laughs> yeah, mine's a service battery. Every time I look at it, I'm just like, ah, "I'm not. I'm not doing that." It can stay plugged in. So kind of talking about that, what is something that you'd really like to make but don't think you can yet? So it could be just like something standing in your way of doing it or you don't feel comfortable doing it, kind of not having the gear for it, but we've just kind of covered that. So, Yeah, I would love, and I've always, always thought this, I would love to do proper a cappella harmonized work. <laughs> of There's this fantastic video um, of Bon, bon Iver, or Bon Iver, um, yeah, I have no idea. He's I, I I've looked at that name so many times and I still haven't got a fucking clue. I've heard people say Bon Iver and then I've said Bon Iver and they look at me funny. Other people look at me funny. I'm like Bon Iver. Like that seems like a very English way to pr- pronounce <laughs> this name. Um, it could be Boniver. It could be Boniver. <laughs> Boniver just all rolled into one. Um, he does a song called Heavenly Father, and there's a specific version of it which is live at the Sydney Opera House. It is absolutely incredible how. And I think any kind of a cappella harmonized thing, how it all weaves into one and how they utilize each other's voices to kind of highlight certain people. Mm -hmm. And the thing holding me back from that is musical knowledge, Mm -hmm. because I'm a very practical musician. I do know my theory and I've done my theory tests and I've done all that stuff. But in understanding really close harmony and being able to write close harmony, that's just a whole nother beast. Right. And I'd love to do that. But what it, it would take is taking the time to sit down and study close harmony. And I don't have that time. That's that's that weird thing these yeah. days. Is that I'd love to become a more proficient music teacher. I'd love, Well, musician in general, because then it would feed back into the music teaching. I'd be able to help more kids with that kind of stuff. 
but because I'm doing so much music teaching, I don't have the time to learn that those new skills. So it's this cycle. Yeah. So in like an ideal world, which would you be doing? Would you be teaching music or would you be making music? I think I, I genuinely, I had, the, I had this thought recently. I really found my thing with teaching music and going to do going to uni to actually do music was a decision which I went in with no idea of what career I was going to go into afterwards which is not the way to go into uni that's that's quite a silly way to go into uni um you say that but I don't honestly know anyone who does go into uni knowing what they want to do yeah i i grew up with a guy who his dad was a quantity surveyor so he went to uni going i'm going to do quantity surveying and lo and behold, he has left uni and he's a quantity surveyor. <laughs> and it's like, that is, I think that's the one example yeah. where it's it's actually turned out that way. Yeah, now I, I went to college with the intention yeah. of becoming a doctor and then dropped out of college. Yeah. Went back the year after, dropped half my courses and then picked up doing computing instead. Right. And then ended up just falling into making games. I've had to have this chat with a few people of if you love something and you love doing something, if you discover something that you really love doing, I actually mm-hmm. would push them to do that at uni. You may not end yeah. up in a career in it, but you will be studying full-time something that you absolutely love rather than yeah. thinking of what career you're going to get out of it. Yeah, that's, that's that's pretty much how I ended up. If anyone listened to the first episode of my podcast, I already told this story, but I am sorry if you did because that episode is fucking terrible. <laughs> oh, like I, I get to see the um the like watch. Yeah. It's not watch, is it? Because it's a podcast. But I, I get to see like how like people listen to it. And since the second episode came out, a lot of people have gone back to the first one. And I, like it's almost even in terms of listens, which means a lot of the people who've listened to the second have gone back and listened to the first. Right. And that's really nice of them, but it's terrible. It's a completely <laughs> different podcast. This is much better. I much prefer this one. Yeah. It isn't just me rambling. Well, I actually know because right now it is just me rambling <laughs> for myself, really, isn't it? But it's, it's not as bad. But yeah, so I just happened to turn up at a guest lecture from one of the guys who would end up becoming one of my lecturers at uni. And it was just a guy who he used to work at Sony. He also, he always pronounced it Sony. Oh. It really pissed me off. Oh, no. um, <laughs> yeah, he, he used to work at Sony and he came and gave a talk. And I was just like, yeah, I like video games. Yeah. Like, I could do this. And then I started programming. It turns out I was pretty good at programming. Um, and I was just like, yeah, fuck it, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I rang him up. Americans won't know this what this is, but I rang him up on clearing. Right, yeah, yeah. Because I got 60 UCAS points. Yeah, but in that, just, it's been a long time since I've had to think about the UCAS system. Well, I, I yep. needed 280. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I got 60. Um, I just rang him up and I was like, have you got any spaces? And they're like, yeah. I was like, all right then. And that was it. I got there and they bumped me up a year, which was nice of them. Um, And then I ended up making video games. I did that for four years. Yeah. And then I've not really made anything this year, which I feel bad about. <laughs> I've tried to make one game a year, and this year I have started like five different games and just fallen off after a couple of weeks with each of them. I think this year's hard. I, I am really interested to see the creative output of any art, like any artist, anyone <laughs> with a creative hobby in this year, because I have not felt any inspiration to write music because mm-hmm. I've seen the same four walls for the past <laughs> four months, uh, longer than four months. I keep doing this. It was... It's five months now. We've seen the same four walls for the past five months and there's no outside inspiration. And I've only just started to really feel kind of comfortable with leaving the house again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I went to a deer park in near Nottingham um, a while back. And that's like the first time where I came home and I was like, oh, I feel like writing some lyrics. Yeah. And that's just because I've gotten out of this flat. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite interested to see how creatives are going to fare after this whole thing. Yeah. So we've got somewhat off topic with the question, but yeah. what you've just said has brought up a better question anyway. I was going to ask you about where you sort of draw your inspiration from otherwise then. You're talking about how, because everyone's sort of like inside because of the virus and everything. Yeah. Like you've not had much inspiration. You don't think other people will have. Whereas I haven't had that issue at all. Right. Okay. Because I don't find inspiration hard to find. And that's not supposed to be like, oh, look at me. I'm great. It was literally <laughs> just like... I just like pick it up from like random places. So yeah. the last game that I th- started making, I'm still really interested in the idea, but I d- it's pretty big. So I don't think I'd ever actually get to make it, but it was, I was inspired to make a game from the song. Uh, it was Goonies versus ET. Oh yeah. Run the jewels. From RTJ. Yeah. 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 
So you know the the hook on that. I'll just bring up the lyrics just so I don't get them wrong. Yeah. So maybe if I had another chance, I would give another chance to you. If I make another wish, I'll wish for a wish for you. Yeah, know it. Yeah. Right. So those two lines just sent me on this like spiral. Yeah. And I just planned out this entire world revolving around these two lines of that that song. That's, that's, I see. I love that. In that, I'm jealous of that mm. in a really weird way because I I can't find inspiration for my own stuff for my own songs or or lyrics or poems or anything like that from other lyrics oh yeah no i can right so i can totally get that i can yeah. totally understand that there are times when it's like i'll be playing a game and i'll see a mechanic and be like oh that mechanic's cool and there are there are games that i have made where i've just outright stolen mechanics from other games yeah like uh for a uni project for my final single person uni project i specify because there was a single person and a team one at the same time and i've spoken about both of them at different times so i'll specifically <laughs> talk about the single one this time yeah um i stole a load of mechanics from like mirror's edge and vanquish and stuff like that just because yeah. i liked those sorts of mechanics and just stuff them all in a game and that was it but generally i don't get i i get inspired to make videos about games yeah i get inspired to make games from everything else i think that's good to have the double output mm-hmm. gives you two angles to go at it from like yeah. i've always had this to it to go again to go back to that kind of project i always wish i'd done i've always wanted to have this like in not not the way of anthony fantano because he's just become a reviewer mm-hmm. but of an analysis channel of yeah. i listen to an album and rather than talking about like oh yeah this track was really good or they should have placed this track before this track and that would have helped it better mm-hmm. like instead go in with a this is the lyrical breakdown this is how it flows from song to song yeah this is the story of this album and because mm-hmm. i'm way more interested in lyrics than music as yeah. as just a as a musician i love reading lyrics and i've read lyrics a lot as like after i've heard the song i may not go back and listen to that song over and over again but i'll go back and read the lyrics and i'll sit and read them as if they're like poems or as if they're like stories and it's yeah i that double output thing would be really interesting to get into because yeah. it would then give me an output to go i've been inspired by music fantastic i can i can put that into something I'm trying not to keep going back to things I said last time, but <laughs> it's almost like having half of the same people on a podcast it means things are going to come up multiple times. But I've actually been really interested in the sort of lyrical breakdown of like music recently, but only in particular mm. one song. But the reason I don't do that is because I don't feel like I have the confidence with music as a whole to comfortably talk about stuff. So like, I'm really interested right. in the song early um, from from. Uh, from no, it is called Run the Jewels too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we had an argument last time. RTJ4. About... Yeah, it still bothers <laughs> me. But yeah, so early from Run the Jewels too, like the lyrics of that, it's such like an impactful song and the lyrics tell this like such, like a clear story. Yeah. Um, And I'm really interested in like a breakdown of that, but I don't feel comfortable doing that myself because like I'm not in that sort of position. So I can like totally get the idea of like breaking stuff down like that. Yeah, I feel like it's, approaching it from a musician's point of view, it's going to be for me an entirely different analysis Mm -hmm. to say if for example you approached it because you'd be looking at it with an entirely different viewpoint i i there's this term in in lyrics called like prosody Mm -hmm. and it's a term that means something is reflected in the music or the application in music is this it's like something is reflected in the music by what is happening in the lyrics or say what's happening in the scene oh yeah, yeah yeah and so like Within video games, you can like reinforce the aspects of the story through like mechanical in, uh, like instruments. Yeah, and stuff. yeah, exactly. And like, yeah. so like, you might get to a line which says, "And we're going up," and the riff will also ascend. There's like, I I use an example when I was when we we're talking about this in uni and songwriting. Um, or Frank Turner does a thing like, "Oh, the lyric is, I've got a new guitar, you've got a drum kit. I know the chorus. It smells like Teen Spirit." And the riff from Smells Like Teen Spirit is then playing in the background. And it's like this storytelling prosody. It's not like rising lyrics or anything like that, but it's a really storytelling way of going, oh yeah, he's mentioned Smells Like Teen Spirit. Here's that riff that everyone knows from Teen Spirit. And it creates that extra link for people in the lyrics of the going, oh, he's mentioned that. That's really interesting that he's now playing that riff. And so I'd look at lyrics from kind of like trying to point out those kinds of things. Yeah, And it's, yeah, it's just interesting. I don't think it's like not worth doing because you will see things that i won't 
and mm -hmm. we could show this to another five like these lyrics the early lyrics we could show these to another five people and they'd pick up stuff that neither of us would yeah like you're sort of talking about like cohesion of the song as a whole yeah whereas i'm specifically interested in the sort of storytelling aspect yeah, of it. yeah. yeah. uh fuck <laughs> I was going to make a point and then I said that sentence instead and then I it's forgot what gone. it was. But I've remembered now, so it's okay. I don't know how to tie it in, though. You know the song Bonfire by Childish Gambino? Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. So I really like that song. Yeah. But there are aspects of the lyrics that really bother me. And it's that I know it's just a choice that he made and it. I just don't understand why. Um, there are a lot of times when he like, make references in the song, but then immediately explains the reference in the follow-up line. And it really bothers me every time. Yeah. Is this the song where he talks about, oh, is it his love for Asian girls? Is this his, is this this one? <laughs> I know this is a really weird thing to talk about in terms of him. The line I'm thinking of particularly is, he goes, made a beat, then murdered it, Casey Anthony. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, because that's someone who killed a child. <laughs> it's like, I, I get the reference. Yeah. But it, it, there's a lot of stuff like that where it's like, immediate, like, set, like set up, immediate payoff. Mm. And it's like you could let some of it sit and it's like it's a weird criticism because it's like I, i'm not like critical of him it's just this one song where it like always really sticks out to me and it's just like yeah something that always bothers me i think it's like a lack of faith in your audience yeah sometimes. that's that's how it comes across yeah because it's it's just like right you're not going to understand this here's an explanation it's yeah it's there's some there's some smart stuff i think i i think he is one of the smartest musicians in like the hip-hop game mm -hmm. um especially his newer stuff and I know that that's like a really weird point with some people is like, no, Charles Gambino was good when he was on Freaks and Geeks and when he was doing like Bonfire. And it's like, yeah, he was good as that specific musician then, but he has really changed in such a way that has made him so, so good in his production wise. Mm -hmm. He's just excelled what he used to do. And the way his influences have changed, like you wouldn't see him rapping about Again, eating Oreos like these white girls that blow me. Yeah. He wouldn't be talking about stuff like that anymore because he's got a daughter. And he, like his daughter is on his records. Yeah. Like there's this lovely, I can't, I, this, is the, this is my biggest gripe with him, is he named his newest album in the most oh, yeah, yeah. stupid way. <laughs> of just numbers. And yeah, I couldn't tell you which one it is, but he gets his, um, he gets his daughter to have a nice little chat with him, essentially about like, do you love me? Do you love mummy? And it's it's just nice. And it's this really wholesome little moment. And I think it shows development. Oh, that, that one's actually be... got a name. Has it? Yeah, that one's called Time. <laughs> uh, okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just I just got it. Look, there's only two songs on the album that have names. Yeah. One of them it's is really Algorithm nice. and then one of them is Time and Time is the one you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think a lot of musicians need to have more faith in their audiences of just to go yeah people are smarter than you think they are let them read into stuff let them let them think about it a little bit is there anything else you wanted to talk about i'm trying to think what is your relationship with putting music in like games do you think it should be kind of interstitial should it just be background or should it play a much larger role it depends because uh, I think the music is more important as to what you're going for within the scene. Like, there's times yeah. when I'm trying to think of an example, but the only thing I can example I can come up with examples for are times when it is relevant. No, like honestly, I can only think of times when it is relevant. So yeah, I suppose it it should always be yeah. relevant. Like <laughs> with music in video games, I've always been very picky choosing music that I've put in stuff. I've had a few where I've just like chosen like a f my friend and I we troll through one of the uh, Kevin McLeod's libraries. Oh yeah. 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 Um, for some stuff to use in one of our games. And then there was the first game we did together. We actually had, we actually got someone from a different uni and got them to make a song for us. Yeah. And there was a lot of back and forth between uh, me and her about that because I, I'm sort of like actually more interested in the like production side of game development. Mm. So I like sort of having like an overview on stuff more than anything. But in this role, I also like contacting the outside people. Yeah, that makes sense. So there was a lot of back and forth in particular between me and her where she, oh, her and I, uh, where she would, um, it's a game about a pig in space. Yep. Set in a future where Earth has become barren and we can't grow crops in uh, on Earth anymore. So we have developed 
like Halo Ring Farms. Yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a you play as a pig escaping. Cool. Okay. <laughs> right. So with the music, we needed something that sort of like gave off this like futuristic spacey vibe. Yeah. So there was a lot of stuff in that, but also because the game is an endless runner. So that meant that we needed it to be a perfect loop. Of course, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of like back and forth between me and her where we got a load of the sort of like direction y stuff down quite quickly. But then there was a load of back and forth between me, her and I where like she would send us something and I'd listen to it and I was like, it's not a loop though, is it? Yeah. And she'd be like, yeah, it is. And it was like, no, it's not. This is, you've got a xylophone that comes in like three seconds from the end <laughs> and it isn't at the start of the track. So it needs to either go or be at the start of the track as well. Um, and it was like, there was just a lot of back and forth with that. So I've always like been very picky with the music we put in games. Yeah. But I think the importance is more that the music needs to be good and needs to fit. It's kind of a shame, but good audio design, because this applies to like sound effects and mm. everything as well. Um, when they're good, you tend to not notice them. Yeah. See, I have this, I've, I've, tur- I've muted the music a lot of the times. Um, when I used to play on PS4, it was just TV muted. And I'd have a podcast on, or I'd have I'd have other music on, and I'd be playing along to that. And since kind of, since getting the PC, I've been like sat down with headphones on, and I'm like, right, I'm gonna I'm going to listen to the music. And mm-hmm. more often than not, I space out, yeah. even though I've gone with that intention of listening to the music. Mm-hmm. I kind of space out. And I assume it's well in my mind as a musician, I kind of want to hear the music. Yeah, and if I had my music in a game or have my music in anything, in a film, in a TV show, I'd kind of want people to notice it. And it's that really weird little, like, but if it is doing a good job, I fully agree with you. If it is doing a great job, it's absorbing you into the atmosphere and you're not paying attention to it. It's just adding to the experience. There's also a, um, I'm pretty sure it was a video, but it was a couple of years ago at this point, so I can't remember exactly why, but I watched something or I heard something, whatever, you know, like, there was something yeah, yeah. Um, about how music in video games, especially, but in just general, over time has become less and less memorable. Yeah. Um, particularly with video games, because it's more like directly addressable. They say that a lot of the reason why games, music in video games as a whole has gotten less and less remem- like memorable over time is because of the added complexity within them. Yeah, okay. So that as we have gotten further and had less to deal with the limitations of music, we have found it easier to make better music, but harder to make more memorable music. Yeah. So it's like, you can remember the tune from Mario, Mm. but it's way harder to remember music from games that came out like this year, than games that came out nearly 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can see that. Like... (laughs) I think the only time I go back and I pay it, I, I force myself to pay attention to music is when Giant Bomb do their Game of the Year stuff and they mm-hmm. always do a best music category. And I sit there and I go, I played this game. Yeah. I've got no idea. Yeah. And I was like, I really need to go back and listen to it. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's just that thing of it does feel every time I listen to that, it's so orchestral mm-hmm. and it's all very overproduced. And I think back to the tunes that I even tunes I've learned on guitar, like I can play Super Mario Land, the main theme from that, just because it's so simple and it's based around this very just basic scale. Yeah. And I could play that to probably people our age, maybe not people <laughs> much younger than us. I could play that to people our age and they go, oh yeah, Mario. But if I played a riff from, let's say, the Last, two, Last of Us 2 soundtrack, mm-hmm. if I learned one of the little guitar bits from that, they wouldn't have no idea. They'd probably think I wrote it myself and yeah. it sounds really nice. They'd have no idea. No, it's... I mean, you, t- granted, some of that can come from just, like, we've had a lot longer for it to, like, permeate the culture, but... Yeah. Particularly with this, like, there's a lot of times when, like, games where the music really stands out mm. and those are the ones you remember, but sometimes it's for good reasons and sometimes it's for bad reasons. Like, sometimes it's because the music's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the music just doesn't suit the game at all. But it tends to be that the ones we forget are the ones where the game, the music fits the game and reinforces what's going on. But the issue is because it does that, it doesn't exactly stand on its own. Yeah. It's kind of an issue with the Doom soundtracks. I can't say, I know there was a lot of fuss about it recently, but I I can't say I've actually, I haven't played Doom uh, 2016. That's Um, fine. It's really good. You should. 
Yeah. And okay. you can get it pretty cheap at the moment. But, nice. Um, so the point is, is that uh, I watched a GDC talk on Mick Gordon making the music yeah. not long ago, and I watched some other stuff about it anyway. But basically, the music in the games isn't music. By that, I mean it is not individual tracks. Right. It is a procedural system where as you do things, things will happen. Right, yeah. It uses like the action and the speed and the things you do within the game to create a track yeah. from a set of stems. Now, in game, it works perfectly. Like it works really well. Yeah. But for one of those things like there's a thing where they've um they go back afterwards and like in the soundtracks, they actually have to like it's apparently really hard to make the soundtrack and that was the issue that came up recently. It's really hard to make the soundtrack because the the music isn't made for listening to. It is made essentially to reinforce what's going yeah. on. And because of that, making it into a track for an album you can listen to is actually really hard because you actually have to give the entire thing structure, which you didn't already have. So what I'm trying to get out with this point, I mean, granted, this is probably the furthest end example you can get to, but what I'm getting at is there's music which supports a game and it can support it really well, but by supporting the game, it ends up not standing on its own and like not being its own thing. Yeah. And like without the experience of the game as well, it ends up being less. But then you get other music from games where it becomes so prominent that it detracts from the game. Like the music can be amazing, but the music can be like so good you like lose what you're doing in the game because of it. I did that a lot with Persona Five. Yeah. I love that soundtrack. I think it's in my mind better than Persona Four. Mm-hmm. But that's just because I'm such a fan of the style and the genre that they went for. Yes, yeah, I just I remember I stopped playing at certain points oh, yeah. just to listen to that music. Mm-hmm. And... Well, I I never finished it, but I still listen to the music. Yeah, I think it's I think a lot of people still do. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people. I'm ignoring Royal. I'm not going back and doing that. Yeah. I've, I've I've made a personal standpoint of I'm not buying a fifty pound game to play. I don't know how much extra content it is, but. I've got a weird little hill to die on there. <laughs> I, I'm tempted to, only because I stopped so early into the main game. Yeah, so... Like, it, yeah. I, d- I only got, I think, like, four dungeons in. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't... I, I got up to uh, Makoto's dungeon. Yeah. And then stopped. I, like, I just fell off then. But I actually did the same thing with four as well. But that soundtrack lives outside of itself. Yeah. Uh, outside of the game. It's just so... I think it's iconic. If you played that music to me, I could tell you where it came from. Mm-hmm. Like, what scene I was sat there playing and you know what when i last experienced it to the point where i don't care about playstation themes i i don't like specialize my playstation by changing up the theme every now and then but i went and bought the ryuji theme because it had i think it's got leblanc's sound it's got the just the cafe leblanc soundtrack on it and i wanted to hear that every time i turned on my playstation and it's like that that's an effect. Like yeah. if if the, if a game has made me go and do that just so I can hear it every single time I play, or every time a single time I play games, that's outside. Of course, that's outside of the game itself. That's reminded me. I used to have, and I still miss it because it was so good. I used to have the um, the Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. Yes, I yeah. got that, and it came with the theme, like the PlayStation theme, and it played the main theme, and it was yep. so good. It was like such a good song. Like I I I really liked that game. And honestly, like I can't tell you I remember the music from it a lot, but I remember yeah. that, and it was so good. Like it, it used to like I every time I turn my PlayStation on, I just get like a little bit sad that I wasn't playing that still. Yeah. <laughs> so this actually talking about this has made me think about like has there been? I can think of two in particular, mm. but have there been any games recently where the music has particularly stood out to you? I in a few different in in a couple of different ways, yeah. Ape Out, have you played yes. that? That Yeah, I've not played it, but I know what you mean. Just insane of just how it approaches music. Not particularly great soundtrack, like the same thing with Doom. It's so reactive yeah. to the gameplay that it doesn't stand really as itself. But that's just as a musical thing, that's 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 incredible that that was created. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of like, yeah, as a as a gameplay music thing. <laughs> Weirdly, Pokemon Black and White 2. Really? And going back to those, I I know I'm a sh- I'm an absolute shill for mm. the you know, Pokemon fifth gen stuff, but yeah. the same thing of I played that as a kid. I played it a lot in car journeys and traveling, yeah. so I didn't have the volume up. Um, I played it essentially on mute the entire time, apart from mm-hmm. some very very like odd 
occasional moments. And so going back and actually listening to all that and get, just going through the soundtrack and listening to those different like town themes, there's obviously the mean one where there's like the fur it walking and it's got accumulator yeah, towns. That That's brilliant little like track. But then it does that thing of you can add to the there's that one. T- I think it is a cu- accumulator town or it might be a different one where you find musicians around the map. And if you talk to them, they'll add to their instrument that they've got in their sprite they'll add that to the soundtrack yeah. of the game. And that's just so cool. I remember that. But yeah, I mean, that's a nice little moment in the entire game. But I think that's that that, that game soundtrack is absolutely stellar. I think it's, it mm-hmm. goes probably the top soundtrack out of like Pokemon games. For me, the ones that particularly stand out both were from last year. They kind of stand out for the same reason. Yeah. In that the soundtrack for them plays like really prominent roles. So Sayonara Wild Hearts. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It is so good. It's kind of a game built around an album. Yeah. It's a somewhat simple video game with really good presentation, but built around this like amazing album. And it is very much not my sort of music. Right. But it is so good. Um, And it has like one of my favorite songs on it. It's called Begin Again. It's such a good song. I, I, it's hard to talk about. <laughs> it was so cool if I could just hit Spotify right now and it would just start playing. <laughs> I can't think of words to describe it. I just really like that one. The other one that particularly stands out to me, though, is uh, Death Stranding. Yeah, yeah, I did hear it. I heard a lot about it. It's complicated because the soundtrack to the game, it, it kind of exists. Didn't they get... Who did they get on it? It depends. It depends which way you mean. I just Was it Churches? Yes. Yeah. So that's what I mean. So there's, there's two soundtracks. Right, there okay. There is the soundtrack that is music in the game. Yeah. And there is the soundtrack that is music that plays over the game brilliant and yeah the, what i mean is is that there are songs there's a it's mostly low roar if i'm being honest um but there are songs that play over aspects of the game but while you're playing it literally like a title card comes up and tells you about the name of the song that's playing right now brilliant um and just... it, like as you're delivering the packages like it'll start just telling you about the song and it'll just play while you're walking and then it'll God. gradually fade out and like a story beat will happen yeah but it's weird because like if you were the reason i specify the distinction is because if you buy the soundtrack you don't get any of those tracks right okay you get a completely different soundtrack which is like the sort of like little tunes and like the little bits of stuff that you will hear during the game like uh there's like a little tune that plays when you like use use like terminals and stuff yeah so there's that one which is kind of what we were talking about earlier where it is just it exists it supports the world it's not hugely memorable on its own like i can remember it but like it's not hugely spectacular mm. but the music that surrounds the game the song by churches is called death surrounded like bring me the horizon did a song called ludens yeah there's a lot of low roar and then bb's theme is one of the best songs it is ridiculously good it's important probably that you don't listen to it <laughs> right okay um because it like it plays a very prominent role in the story and it would yeah. diminish the role in the story if you listen to it. See, I, is... I quite like that. I, quite, I like knowing that Yeah. because I wouldn't just not listen to this soundtrack now and I will wait until yeah. I play it. It's it's a shame Yeah. because it's amazing. <laughs> you can... Basically, yeah. any other song is fine. Like, uh, like Ludens is a pretty good song. Like, I don't like current Bring With Horizon. I used to like Bring With Horizon. I liked um, mm. Suicide Season. That was a really good album. And then I got the one after it with a ridiculously long name. And it was all right. I stopped listening. I stopped listening to Bring Me Horizon when I was younger, and yeah. all all fair points in that they had to stop the proper yeah. hardcore, like proper metal stuff because of his voice. But it just stopped being the band that I liked, and that's yeah. you know that's unfortunate that you know his his damage to his voice mm-hmm. and his own, you know self care kind of made me stop listening. But you know it's 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 the way it goes sometimes. But yeah, well, I'm I'm kind of the yeah. opposite in that. I, I well actually, if I'm being honest, I only really like one album. <laughs> yeah. But there was the first album, like album album, which had all of that on. The one with them, I used to make out with Medusa on it. Yeah. Because it's the only song I can remember off the top of my head. <laughs> There's that one, and then he stopped screaming, and then there was Suicide Season, and I really like Suicide Season. Yeah. And then they did another album after that with a really long name, and I bought that one as well, and I was like, yeah, it's all right. And then I just fell off completely. And literally the next song I listened to them was last year when I listened to Ludens. Right. Okay. 
the, yeah, so the point I'm getting at is, is there's a lot of songs um, around the game Death Stranding, which are just really good. Mm. And you can actually listen to them in game as well, which is nice. But, it's always yeah. a good touch. Like that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's smart. It's it, the whole thing. The, the same thing with Black Panther mm-hmm. of that. They've got the in-film soundtrack, the, you know, the music that was composed for the yeah. film. But then they got Kendrick Lamar to do that extra album which is like the music kind of some of some of the tracks just didn't even feature in the film some of them did the odd the odd one um but i remember having this chat with lat on the server of going how many did you actually notice and he's like yeah maybe two it's like yeah "Yeah, but that entire album's awesome Mm -hmm. and it's like i think it's such an interesting thing of to go we're gonna have the composed music but also have an album of songs which have been inspired by watching the film or or the story of the film or or the like you know the story of the game and that kind yeah. of thing it's just adds that extra element i was really disappointed in the the in movie soundtrack yeah for black panther like i felt like it didn't do what i was expecting yeah like i i thought it was going to be sort of like african stuff but that sort of like blended with other areas to sort of show the like cultural mash that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it just didn't feel like it did any yeah. of that. And I was like constantly disappointed by it, it not doing that. Like there was little bits where it like go into it, but it just never felt like enough. But like the Kendrick led album, that does that. Like it has, mm-hmm. it has like right. African drumming mixed in into these like hip hop and rap tracks. And it's, mm-hmm. it works. It, it blends them in a really interesting way. And it's a shame they didn't use more of that in the film. Cause that would have been a fantastic, like not just musical thing, but to, to get all symbolic about the whole culture of it, of Wakanda being yeah. African nation, which still has all of its heritage, all of its like all of its traditions, but has been modernized. And the music reflecting yeah. that, like we've said with the whole games thing, would have just enhanced it in in a brilliant way. But I think the only sort of like time I remember one of the tracks being actually in the film is the uh when they're in the South Korea. Leaving the casino. Yeah. 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 That's that's the main time I can remember it happening, and couldn't tell you another. Okay, then uh, we seem to have come to like a bit of a stopping point. Is there anything else? Like I say, I didn't have anything else written. So if you had other things you wanted to talk about, that's fine. But... No, I, mean, I I I just like I like chatting about music. <laughs> this is just it. I love chatting about music. Yeah, that's and... fine. That was that was why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> right, I guess I'll stick to the outro then. So, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Really loved it. <laughs> yeah. Like the technicals issue, technicals, technical issues at the start, notwithstanding, it's been good. <laughs> yeah, it's been really good. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Thanks for everyone for listening. Special thanks to my patrons, Heaven Over Hell and Justin Wood. As I mentioned earlier, I have a Patreon. Uh, you can join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Holden Gatsby. And for $1 a month, you'll get to see what I'm working on early and get exclusive roles in my Discord. Yeah, I wrote all that down so I'd remember to say it properly. <laughs> it's it's very well rehearsed. There's currently still three positions left open in my the board tier where you can come and pay a dollar and then you will forever get every benefit that anyone else gets. So if I add like a thirty dollar tier later on, but you're part of the the board and you're paying one dollar, you will still get the benefits that that thirty dollar tier gets. I don't see why that would ever happen. I don't think anyone's ever going to give me that much money, but just on the off chance, like maybe it's worth getting in on the ground floor. Uh, Otherwise, there will always be the shareholder tier, which is just a dollar. It will always be a dollar. You will get that. It's fine. You can also just follow for free. And if you follow for free, you will just get notifications every single time I do anything. So if you need a good way of following me, that's probably the best. There's also my Discord, my Twitter, my Twitch. All the other podcast platforms, all of those are going to be linked in the description. Yeah, thanks for sticking around. Bye.